Well, good morning. I'm Fred Kremkaw, and uh, I'm an electrical engineer who uh, finds himself in a 44-year uh, academic medicine career at the University of Rochester and Yale and uh, now at Wake Forest. Uh, the topic for uh, this 30 minutes is something that's been said almost, almost cavalierly uh, several times this morning that uh, ultrasound is safe. So we want to, that would be an arrogant statement to make uh, if you didn't have evidence to back it up. So that's what we're here to talk about uh, in this session. Uh, we'll be looking at it uh, in two ways. First, uh, I'll be looking at it from the science perspective, and uh, I'm professor of diagnostic radiology and director of the Center of Medical Ultrasound at Wake Forest. And then following me uh, will be Dr. Guerra, who will uh, give us uh, the government perspective. As we look at, uh, let's go for a swim. So as we watch the swim, are we doing any harm? And of course, in any medical procedure, whether it's diagnostic or therapeutic, we want to help and not harm, or at least have the harm justified and have it uh, to be minimum. One of my close friends is a former Marine Corps officer. He has a bumper sticker that I love. It says, to err is human, to forgive is divine. Neither is Marine Corps policy. <laughs> well, we don't want to do harm. Uh, surgery certainly does harm, but uh, if, you, if the result is, uh, out, outweighs the harm, then you do it. And we all understand that. And so the question is, uh, what's going on here with uh, ultrasound and harm? First thing I want to do is take you through this slide. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I knew that's what would happen uh, if I did that, uh, or that uh, you would fall into a PowerPoint coma uh, here before lunch. Well, what is sound? We're here. We're all hearing it right now. And why? Uh, why do we even have to think about safety? Well, because sound is a form of energy. The definition of energy is something that can do work. In this context, work would be to produce a bioeffect that would be undesirable. Sound is simply a traveling pressure variation. As I speak, I make the pressure in the air go up and down here, and those pressure variations travel to you, and you hear sound. Uh, the cycles of sound there, uh, how many there are in a second, determines the frequency. That determines the pitch that we hear. And if you keep going up in frequency, eventually we as humans can't hear it anymore, and we call it ultrasound. The prefix ultra means beyond. And so it simply means higher in frequency than what uh, we can hear. So we find ourselves working in the megahertz range, uh, and uh, in the metric system, mega means million. So this would be millions of cycles per second. Uh, that, the, uh, the mega comes from Greek word megas, which means large, actually. And so we're using megahertz ultrasound to do the imaging that you've been seeing all morning. This, by the way, means that women's ultra mega, that is women's beyond large wellness program. <laughs> I don't think that's what GNC intended, but now that you know that that's what that means. Well, we've been seeing all morning how wonderful uh, ultrasound is, uh, the advantages that it has for us, in particular uh, with regard to other imaging methods, and uh, Dr. Guerra will be looking at that in more detail with regard uh, to safety. But this uh, cartoon has a message. I'm taking you off vitamin C for a while. Why is that? Because too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And that's the question we're asking. Ultrasound's a great thing, but is too much ultrasound bad? And if so, how much would that be? And in what way would it be bad? And that's the whole question of risk and um, safety. So here's what we know. We know about bioeffects. 
experimental studies. There are hundreds of reports in the literature, in uh, peer-reviewed literature. Uh, the studies of bioeffects of ultrasound have been going on for nearly a hundred years, starting long before diagnostic ultrasound was even around. So we have plenty of material here on the effects of ultrasound on molecules, on living cells, on plants, on animals, and of most importance to us, on humans. Now in humans, that's the thing we want to know the most, but we have limitations on what we can do in humans for obvious reasons. So a lot of the information we get from the closest thing to humans, and that would be mammals, and uh, in particular uh, with mice and rats, which are favorites for a lot of these kinds of studies. So here I've given just some examples of the kinds of endpoints that have been studied and reported upon. Under what conditions can ultrasound produce effects like this in mammals and presumably in uh, humans too? What conditions of ultrasound would be required to do that. We don't want to forget that some effects can be beneficial. In fact, therapeutic ultrasound uh, was around before diagnostic ultrasound. It's still used in physical therapy today, and there are more uh, specific applications now for high-intensity focused ultrasound that are developing all the time. But we're concerned about those effects that would be deleterious. This is the uh, statement, the official statement approved by the AIUM Board of Governors uh, regarding bioeffects in mammals. I'm not going to go through it in detail, of course, but just to make you aware that we have statements like this. We, we know about interaction mechanisms. How is it that bioeffects can occur? What is it about ultrasound as an energy form that interacts with living tissue to cause changes? We call these interaction mechanisms. Shakespeare actually knew about these um, here in Macbeth, where uh, he wrote, double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn, and cauldron bubble. So we have the two primary mechanisms there in Macbeth, and they are heat, the thermal mechanism, and cavitation. Now, we know a lot about heat and how it can damage living material and cells, and this is just an example of uh, what you would expect, and that is the greater the temperature rise that you have in tissue, and these data aren't even from ultrasound. These are from water bath, but ultrasound can uh, increase tissue temperature, and uh, as you would expect, the greater the tissue temperature, the less time required to produce bioeffects, and these data points are bioeffects that have occurred uh, in animals. And you notice here that for an exposure time of less than 10 minutes, it's going to take more than 4 degrees uh, temperature rise Celsius to produce effects. So we can then compare that to temperature rises that we get in tissue under ultrasound conditions and come to some conclusion. Uh, for example, here, just a graph, uh, an example of the kind of thing that you could uh, calculate or measure uh, temperature rise over some time with some exposure of ultrasound. The second mechanism would be non-thermal, uh, and it includes a class of mechanisms actually, but the primary one would be cavitation, which is the production of bubbles, their vibration, and ultimate collapse. And uh, when they collapse, they can produce shock waves that can be uh, damaging. In fact, there are instruments like this that are ultrasonic that are intended to break up cells uh, in the bi uh, biology lab. And it is uh, this cavitation that uh, causes pitting in uh, steel propeller blades in uh, ships. Here are data uh, that tell us uh, the uh, conditions under which this mechanism can produce bioeffects. So we have knowledge about that. We know about instrument outputs. Uh, we know what kind of energy comes out, and there's various ways of measuring that. Uh, this is just to show uh, data like that and uh, how we have different outputs uh, in these instruments operating in different modes. So we have that information. 
the FDA, in fact, uh, limits outputs uh, based on uh, data that they had when, uh, when the first relevant law was passed back in the 70s, actually, uh, that uh, required the FDA to do something about this. And based on the equipment that was available up to that time and the outputs associated with the uh, various kinds of applications of that equipment, they came up with these numbers which uh, they used to limit outputs uh, for their approval process. Uh, back in the early 90s, uh, the AIUM and several organizations and the FDA uh, got together and said, we need to have a good way of giving the user an indicator of what the output is right now as they are doing the scan. And that resulted in a couple of uh, indices. The thermal index, which we're seeing here, is an estimate of the temperature rise occurring in tissue under the scanning conditions that are occurring. And here we see an example of the mechanical index, which is uh, an, an estimate of what's going on with the non-thermal mechanism. And uh, this was a publication that uh, followed that where um, measurements were made of these ind indices uh, on instruments operating in various modes. So we know about instrument outputs. The uh, AIUM through the BioFX uh, committee, uh, which I've chaired in the past, and then uh, puts together these uh, statements. Uh, then for board approval, um, I'm past president of AIUM. I forgot to mention that I'm representing the AIUM here at this conference. And so we have all of these uh, official statements from the AIUM that are available on our website, and you can look at them uh, readily if you're interested in any of them. So they uh, summarize all of this information that we have. When we put all of that together, what do we conclude? Well, I have quoted from a couple of these statements, and essentially what they say is that based on all the information that we have, the operating uh, characteristics that we know we have, the epidemiology that's actually been done on humans under the uh, influence of ultrasound results in no causal relationship between ultrasound and any adverse effects. To say that briefly, we would say there's no known risk to the use of ultrasound the way we apply it today. So what do we do in, in uh, practice? We, use, uh, we implement the ALARA principle, which says that we recognize there may be risk that we're not aware of. To minimize that, we minimize exposure. And there are really two, uh, three ways to do that. Uh, we minimize exposure by using it for medical indication only. No problem here. That's what we're talking about. We minimize exposure time. Everybody is time conscious for efficiency, that gets automatically done, and then using those indices we minimize exposure output. Any questions? Well, this guy's got a question. So, so is it safe? Uh, the way we ask the question is, does the benefit justify the risk? That's the way we do it in medicine, and the answer is yes. Thank you. <laughs>